This says nothing you haven't heard, but I, I just find it helpful to summarize every now and again the principles that which drive this particular discipline and just remember, recall where we are. Sure. Is that better? But if we just go on to, this, to my second set of principles, this is where we sort of come up with the concept of mismatch. We basically live in very different environments to those through which the, the bulk of, our, and of the environments in which our, the selective processes that define what we are that are operated. And there are constraints which we've alluded to about the speeds and direction of selection, the scope of plasticity, that, in, that, that constrain the speed and the nature of evolution we processes, that means that we can be mismatched with the environment in which we live, and that can be, lead to ill health. And as I mentioned on the first day, definitions of normality and, and abnormality in disease are not absolute, and they depend somewhat on the match or mismatch between the environment the individual is in and their, and their variation in phenotype. And it's interesting that in the two classifications of the pathways to disease risk, answering the question that George and Randy first posed, why is natural selection left our bodies vulnerable to disease, right at the top of both lists come the question of mismatch namely that we're living in an evolutionary mismatched or novel environment. By novel environment, I'm referring to the concept that selection can only operate within the range of environments that our lineage has been experienced before, and the reaction norm that, we, that our species has, therefore, will be relate in some way to the range of environments our lineage has been exposed to. So let's just again go through this example, which is a good example of context-specific definition for normality. And this is the classic case of lactose, persist lactase persistence, lactose intolerance. Humans largely evolved in a world with access, without access to animal milk. The only milk that humans had until 10,000 years ago, roughly in Europe, or 250 years ago in Australia was human milk. And weaning occurs depending in different cultures between two and four years of age in, in ancestral times. And therefore being able to absorb the complex carbohydrate, the disaccharide, uh, which is split into glucose and lactose, uh, galactose, lactose, uh, after weaning had no nutritional significance. All humans express the enzyme lactose in their gut at birth, which allows you to break up lactose into the two sugars for absorption. If you don't have the gene for lactase, you inevitably die. It's a lethal, it's a lethal uh, unless you're fit, diagnosed immediately at birth, it's a very rare disease, the lactase gene mutation, which actually just makes lactase not work at all. All children express lactase, the enzyme in their gut, but when you measure it in most individuals around the world, the levels of lactase, the enzyme in the small intestine that breaks up the sugar, disappears between about three and five years of age. And as adults, about 70% of the world's population do not express significant amounts of lactase in their gut, and about but 30% do. Now, depending on whether you express that enzyme in your gut, when you drink large amounts of lactose containing con substance of foods as an adult, you either get gastrointestinal symptoms, which can be particularly unpleasant, or you don't. Now, why can some people absorb lactose? They can do so because there's a mutation in the at least amongst Europeans, there's a mutation about 13.4 kilobases 5 prime to the start site of the lactase gene, which if it mutates from a C to T, which is interesting because it's actually a CPG site, 
which may me uh, reflect a biased mutation, which is why it's been so frequent. Um, uh, if that mutation occurs, then the gene does not get turned off between three and five years of age, but persists. So this is a gene in a, promoter, in a distal control region of the, prom, uh, of the extended promoter, which determines whether the gene is continuously expressed in the intestinal epithelium or whether it's turned off, the site, this, this region. It's interesting that this one mutation has clearly appeared repeatedly, but the one of particular interest it occurred in Europeans about 8,000 years ago, which is roughly when dairy farming appeared in Europe. And one can come up with the uh, hypothesis that, the, that of the co-evolution of the cultural habit of farming cows with the ability to absorb milk appearing by way of this persistence mutation, even to better nutritional state, better reproductive fitness, etc., etc., etc. There's a second mutation, which does the same thing in a different part of the in, in, in a different part of the promoter region of the gene, which also causes lactase persistence, and that appeared in Africa about 2,000 years ago, when again uh, cattle pastoralism appeared in East Africa. So we have two radiating populations with different mutations: one in Europe, one in from in Eastern Africa which lead to lactase persistence. And as I said the other day, this leads you to this issue of what's normal, what's abnormal. If a person who doesn't have the persistent gene <coughs> stays away from milk, are symptom free, and they're perfectly normal individuals. And they're appropriate for an environment, which is their ancestral environment, lacking milk, other than human milk. But if they move to an environment or culture changes in their environment such that there's large amounts of milk in their adult diet, they're mismatched to the environment and they have symptoms. They're mismatched because they're now living in an environment different to that in which their lineage evolved. And this leads to the issues of who's abnormal. And of course neither is abnormal. It's just people with different variations in the allele which depending on their context of whether they're living in a lactase free or a lactase non-free world have different physiology. And this just is a very simplistic but a very good example of just understanding how you can change your perception of what is illness when one thinks about this issue of evolutionary novelty leading to a mismatch between the environment and the individuals, uh, in this case both genotype and phenotype. And in a more generic sense, this is, serves as an introduction to the concept of mismatch, name, which is very simple, but simply is saying that the individual is living in an environment beyond their evolved capacity to adapt to that environment, therefore they're living at the extreme of their reaction norm, of the reaction norm for the population. And that is leading to disease or symptoms of ill health, or it may even be that the environment is not a matter of range, but simply it's a totally novel challenge the environment the individual has never seen before. And I've just given you some of the obvious examples that we have. We'll talk a minute about energy rich, the, the nutritional and energetic environment we now live in, which is clearly in some way associated with most causes of obesity. The new physical environment may matter far more than we realise. We talked yesterday, Randy talked about myopia, the changed environment of myopia, and you can see that while there were different explanations, there's something about living in the built environment with artificial light and the way we live that is clearly playing a role in creating the environmental context where if you have the gene that predisposes you towards myopia, it can be the consequences are expressed. I could talk a lot about the implications of change social and societal structures, and I'm just going to give you a flavour of that momentarily. We could talk about novel toxins and, in a sense, our inability to cope with a number of things that lead to uh, dysmorphology are a result of not our livers not having evolved 
in environments where we're exposed to those toxins, which means that we do not have the detoxifying mechanisms for those, while we have detoxifying mechanisms for many other substances. And then there are the changes in the parasitic symbiotic environment, which I think will play right into some of the discussion which may come out of the, one of the working groups that's going on on, 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 on allergy and autoimmunity, or will come up in some of the other talks. And I won't go into that now, because I think it will come up. So just to use the obvious and most simple example, obesity. Lifestyle-induced obesity and its complications is an example of effectively evolutionary novelty. We've never lived in environments like we live in now with these high glycemic, high glycemic foods, these energy-dense diets, and with a very different, probably, range of macronutrient uh, uh, exposures. It's less clear, interestingly enough, how much our energy expenditure has decreased. It's generally assumed there's been a remarkable decrease in energy expenditure for the modern Western human from what it was 20,000 years ago, although other, some anthropologists have, have debated this. So the clarity on the energy outside of it is not as clear as people might think. Now that's not to say that every cause of obesity is mismatch. There are medical causes of obesity. I've listed two or three at the bottom, both single and complex mutations and some endocrine disorders. But putting that aside, first order, most obesity is simply a case of mismatch. And obesity, we need to understand, obesity in itself, unless it's very morbid, doesn't necessarily cause disease. There are forms of body fat storage which are reasonably healthy, steatopigia, on the buttocks of African women would be such an example. And in fact, there are medical scientists who would argue that fat under the skin is not particularly unhealthy. It's fat when it gets deposited in your liver and in some of your visceral tissues. That is where the disease complications arise from. So let's just use a slightly vaguer, ter broader term than obesity and talk about metabolic adaptive capacity. That is your capacity to handle high energy loads without, and dispose of that energy either storaging in healthy fat or using it in some other way. And effectively we're talking about the insulin uh, glucose axis, the leptin adipokine axis and so forth. And if you think about it and look at the green line as the reaction norm for our metabolic adaptive capacity. Our ability, just keep it simple, our ability to handle an energy load and get rid of that energy without having higher levels of blood glucose that lead us to get diabetes. You can imagine that the range of that reaction norm is largely set, is set, has been determined by our evolutionary past. This is the range of energy environments which we were exposed to over, our, our ancestors were exposed to, and that's established because fitness would have been lost at either, either end of the spectrum, it may not be symmetrical, that doesn't, that's just a cartoon, and you would imagine that that's uh, how the reaction norm for metabolic adaptive capacity is. But of course what's happened is in the last 100 years, last 50 years, depending last 200 years since the agricultural revolution, we've shifted the energy environment that way. There's not been any shift, or no significant shift, in the ge genetic determinants of our metabolic adaptive capacity, whether they are fixed genetic determinants or the developmentally plastic determinants, determinants we talked about yesterday, which under, after all, are and turn under genetic control. And you can see that as a result of that, more people at the right are living in environments beyond the reaction norm, from the upper limits of the reaction norm, as it evolved, and therefore that it gets exposed as disease. In this case, diabetes or some of the other complications. That's a very simplistic concept of mismatch, but it works rather well. Now, just for those of you who are interested, I want to point out that 
these things, these kind of mismatched things can evolve very slowly. This is a slide of the energy balance intake. How much energy you take in versus how much you expend. And if you maintain your weight constant, you'll spend, you'll, you'll roughly, ex you'll will exactly expend as much energy a day as you take in. If you're only half a percent out per day over a year, that's only 12 calories a day more, over the course of a year, you'll have put on 1.5 to 2 pounds in weight. Now, it doesn't go up quite as linearly as you think, but if you have a 1% error in this control mechanism, 25 calories a day, you're roughly 3 pounds heavier at the end of the year. The point I'm trying to make here is, in this kind of stuff, we're not looking for gross changes in physiological control. Relatively subtle changes in physiological control a 1% change between our appetite control and our peripheral energy uh, dispersal systems can end up leaving you, over several years, rather obese and metabolically compromised. And so one of the problems is of, in the obesity field is the kinds of studies that people have been doing largely using GWAS approaches are looking for the kinds of things which manifestly will not exist. We're actually looking for very subtle changes rather than giant changes in control systems. We're looking for a half percent change. Given that obesity takes 10, 20, 30 years to, to fully evolve, you're looking at perhaps only 5, 10 calories a day difference between energy in, energy out. And you can see the complex situations that can emerge. I want to dive down into one specific example because this is an example which interests me immensely, which goes on from this idea of metabolic compromise. And that is the idea, the, the phenomenon of gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is a form of, di of type 2 diabetes that appears in pregnant women. They don't have diabetes when they start their pregnancy, they have diabetes during pregnancy, it resolves after pregnancy, but they've got a higher chance of developing diabetes uh, within the next five to ten years after the pregnancy, and they'll probably have diabetes in every future pregnancy that they have anyhow. It's got an incidence roughly in the Western countries, not clear how, what it was, there's been some definitional issues, of about eight to ten percent of pregnant women appear to have gestational diabetes. It's quite clear it's linked to the nutritional state of the woman. Fatter women, women on high energy intakes before and during pregnancy are more likely to get gestational diabetes. Now gestational diabetes is quite an important condition. When mother gets a high blood glucose level, glucose goes straight across the placenta and leads to high levels of glucose in the fetus. The fetus then secretes more insulin. Insulin in the last gestation of, of pregnancy in the fetus. Remember Peter Ellison told you the other day that human fetuses are very fat at birth? <coughs> and the thing that makes them fat is the insulin levels in the fetus. Insulin is the adipogenic hormone of fetal life. It drives the, deposit, the, uh, the, um, the development of more fat cells and, store, and dumps fat into them. The fetus can get sufficiently big as a result of this, it cannot be delivered through the vaginal canal. When you hear these 12, 13 pound babies, these are inevitably, well not inevitably, usually the result of gestational diabetes during pregnancy. And dystocia is, when the, is the clinical term for a fetus not being able to exit the pelvic canal and can lead to all sorts of problems emerging cesarean sections if you, and so forth. But more than that, because the fetus has had a high level of glucose, of insulin, the second the umbilical cord gets cut, there's no longer a supply of glucose to the newborn baby, and the fetal glucose levels, this, the newborn baby's glucose levels then plummet, and they plummet right down to basically zero. The, fetus, the newborn baby will seize, go unconscious, and quite serious brain damage can occur. Now this is happening in 10% of pregnancies. What is going on? 
this very interesting situation. Some degree of insulin resistance is a normative part of all pregnancies. Women increase the, have a degree of insulin resistance develop as, they, uh, as, as, as pregnancy persists. It's in fact induced by placental lactogen and placental growth hormone secreted by the placenta, so the degree of insulin resistance is related to the placental development. And the reason for doing that is if mother has a level of insulin resistance, then she will burn more fatty acids and as her energy source, and the glucose will trust to the fetus. And this is important because there are two tissues in which glucose uptake is not as concentration dependent, not insulin dependent. In most tissue cells, insulin is responsible for driving glucose into the cell. The placenta, getting glucose across the placenta, is concentration dependent. The more glucose on one side, the more glucose crosses and our brain to the other place. Getting glucose into our brain has nothing to do with insulin directly. The amount of glu blood glucose that gets to our brain is dependent on concentration and blood flow. We also know that fetal growth is directly related to glucose supply. Now it's very interesting if you think about this. Every other, every other nutrient that gets to the fetus has a limited supply has limitations in its transport across the placenta. There are, there are fatty acid control transport mechanisms, there are amino acid transport mechanisms, but glucose is not controlled. And yet we know if high levels of glucose appear, mother and fetus can potentially die because of dystocia. Does this suggest that therefore gestational diabetes was very rare in our evolutionary past, presumably because nutritional levels in our population were much less. And what we're seeing now is there was no need in our evolutionary past to have developed a barrier to glucose crossing, crossing uh, the placenta. Now there is a need to limit the amount of glucose that crosses the placenta. If you think about that, you can come up with some hypotheses about the fact that suggests that this rapid, this rise in nutritional uh, intakes in recent times is a result has consequences which must mean that this is a remarkably new phenomenon in our lineage. Now, I work part of the time in Singapore. I'm dealing with the issue now that 22% of my population has gestational diabetes. This is rising at, and Hong Kong now reports 30% of their population with gestational diabetes. We have come to the point now in Asia where we are having to start nutritional management clinics for all pregnant women because the incidence of macrosomia and its consequences is so high as a result of this that we're having to get quite aggressive about nutritional management of people in Asia. An example where the nutritional novelty and the mismatch of these high energetic levels against the background of a physiological state which exacerbates the likelihood of developing diabetes has led to consequences uh, which have to be addressed at the public health level. Now I don't want to go on about that but I do want to shift to another example of mismatch and pick up on something that Gillian talked about in her talk on Bangladeshi uh, uh, migrant girls developing precocious puberty to expand the, to expand the discussion about puberty further to talk about biological cultural coevolution and how that can induce some mismatches as well in the life course. The most obvious example of this is what's happening to, in our reproductive behaviours. We're seeing a mar marked shift, and this is old data and it's shifted further to the right now, at the age of women choosing to have their, their first child. This is in Canada in the 1970s and the 1990s, and it's further to the right now. Um, uh, there's been a dramatic shift. If you look at the chances, this is the chances in 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 37-year-old women of conceiving at, at, at peak fertility in their cycle, you can see that it's declining quite rapidly fertility in unprotected cycles 
as women age. And we're getting to the point now where the age of first conception, due to cultural reasons, is at a time when, for many women when reproductive fertility has, for whatever reason, for the reasons that uh, were talked about the other day, uh, declined quite rapidly. The result of that's more in vitro fertilization. And so we're now up to large percentages of women are requiring reproductive assistance to, um, to conceive. And this is simply an example where our culture has shifted our reproductive behaviors, but our biology remains with what it was before, namely that peak reproductive success occurs earlier in life that now when, than when women choose uh, to reproduce. And the consequence is a different way uh, in which conception is actually occurring. Puberty is another example. Puberty has quite variable timing of onset. In girls, somewhere between 8 and 14 years is probably within the normal range, if one thinks across all populations in the world. Its timing can be accelerated by earlier poor conditions. As Gillian pointed out the other day, she gave an example of the Bangladeshi uh, girls. It can be also accelerated by earlier good conditions. Relatively obese children, nutritionally rich children, have, tend to have earlier puberty. Its timing can also be delayed by poor conditions. Undernutrition late in childhood delays puberty, whereas poor nutrition early in childhood ten, or before birth accelerates the onset of puberty. And you can see, and this is just to give you another example, Gillian pointed out in her, in her Bangladeshi girls move, being adopted or migrating to Western, Western conditions, earlier onset of puberty. This is data oh, I, 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 published by, by anthropologists recently on looking at the age of Menarche in stable hunter-gatherer societies living in marginal conditions in different parts of the world. And they just looked at the risk probability of survival to age of 15 as an indication of the um, quality of the environment these children are living in. And you can see that in those where there's a high extrinsic mortality rate, the age of menarche is reduced, which is highly compatible with the kinds of life history arguments that Steve Stearns presented you with on the first day of this meeting. And there's a big shift. And you can see five years difference in the age of menarche, which is really an enormous shift that can be identified in relationship to uh, the A, to, uh, which, to, with a high association with the, um, with the survival rate. And as Gillian told you the other day, we see the same sort of thing in sexual precocity. In this case, in the case of adopted migrants, these are children from Bangladesh or Pakistan who were adopted into Scandinavian countries. And you can see that up to 30% of them in some studies have entered puberty, started breast two as the earliest stage of puberty in girls before the age of eight, which is outside the normative range, and some 10% of them have, been, have had their menarche by the age of, of, of 10 years, which again is very, very young. And a number of us have seen girls menstru menstruating as young as six years of age as a result of this uh, de life course developmental change. But it doesn't only apply to these extreme situations. Remember, we've argued, Steve's made the point, that life course uh, factors, you would expect to have a reaction norm. And I've argued yesterday that the conditions of ordinary life would affect uh, the trajectory of development uh, of, uh, in a number of ways. And Deb Sloboda from my group in Auckland took a thousand girls from the RAIN cohort in, in Perth, Australia, and just looked at them in terms of quartiles of birth weight and quartiles of weight at, at seven years of age. And you can see here that the, this is the cumulative rate, rate of developing menarche. The quartile of girls who were the smallest at birth and largest at eight years of age, 
had an age of onset of menarche about one year earlier than girls who were largest at birth and thinnest at, at seven years of age. And that's a big shift. It's almost 12 months, which if you think about it in terms of its potential influence on the reproductive life course of a woman, and therefore her potential fitness, is a very large potential shift in number of potential offsprings you could have indeed. So even with a normal Western population, we can see echoes that the age of puberty is very, uh, is very flexible. Now we have far less data about boys. And the reason for that is, how do you get data on boys? Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. It is one way. Uh, but as far as we can tell, for males it's relatively similar for girls. This is interesting because, again, this highlights the interplay that's going on between her and these changes. This is data on girls who are born small, who are having accelerated age of puberty. And you can see we can delay the onset of puberty in these girls who've had an early start to life by giving them a drug that sensitizes them to insulin. Insulin resistance is part of the mechanism of it and causes its effects on the hypothalamus that accelerates the age of puberty in these children. And you can see if it made sense, and it does for some of these girls to do so, we don't have to affect their hormonal control, as we talked about the other day in Gillian's example. We could actually do it by looking at the metabolic state of these children and making them more insulin sensitive. You can delay the age of puberty uh, of menarche if you get to them when their breasts have started to develop by up to about two years. This is Francis de Zager's work uh, from Belgium, along with David Dunger and, and, and Lords Ebenez from Barcelona. Very interesting work indeed. So you can come up with reaction norms like this, where you relate children's nutritional status, the age of menarche, and early developmental growth, and, and, and poorer fetal growth, as to explain the age of menarche. And we did this based on a lot of data Mark Hansen and I, and pointed out it's particularly girls who are children who, are, who get obese, where you can just, just detect this enormous effect of a poor state in early life, accelerating the timing of menarche. Now, where am I heading on all this? The other point I want to make about this is these earlier menarches do appear to be of life history relevance in the sense if it does appear to be associated with a change in the timing of fertility, an acceleration in their reproductive performance. It could have been that, yes, they have earlier periods, but their, their ability to ovulate doesn't accelerate, and therefore, in life history terms, it has no long-term significance. But when we look at girls who have early menarche, 50% of them ovulating within one year, of, 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 of uh, having early menarche, whereas if you have late menarche, it takes much longer to develop fertility. In other words, it does look as if this acceleration of menarche we see in some of these children is indeed associated with an integrated life history. In some way, accelerating puberty is allowing you, and, and fertility is part of the appropriate response to living the starting life in somewhat threatened conditions. But having spent all this time on puberty, it's not the point I want to make. The point is, puberty is a process of biological maturation. What is adolescence? Adolescence is the process which you go through as you're going through and after puberty until you're accepted within that society as an adult. And what I think is happening in Western societies is we're seeing a much more prolonged period of adolescence than was traditionally the case, and is certainly the case in most traditional societies, at least for women. We are now not accepting many of our young people as adults until much later. Now, and the importance of this is, I think, of immense importance and has some relevance to what's happening in Great Britain in the last 72 hours. As all of you know, the age of puberty is falling. This is the data in girls 
And you can see between 1840 and 1960, the age of Menarche, first period, has fallen from by about four years, and indeed it's continued to fall since then. This is for, and in the populations, of, you can see it's now, although it's not falling at the same rate, the average, the onset of Menarche in some of these populations shown on that graph is now less than 12 years of age. So we've had a five-year fall in the age of Menarche, a remarkable shift. A really remarkable shift, you think about, in a critical life history factor in populations in less than 200 years. It can be shown even more dramatically here for women from Britain. And you can see, if we just look here at the cumulative onset of girls having menarche, you can see in 50-year difference in the age of birth, in the birth cohort, you can see there's been more than a one-year shift in the age of menarche. These are really dramatic things. Now, what's going on? We largely think this is a function of better maternal health and better child health, allowing these, taking the brakes off the timing of puberty. And I'll come back to that in a moment, in fact, here. We actually know quite a lot about the age of menarche in girls, even back to Rome, although the data set in Rome uh, is somewhat doubtful. Uh, but it's reasonably clear that the age of, that most girls in Rome had menarche, at least according to the classicists, between about 12 and 13 years of age. Most girls were married in Rome by the age of 12 to 13. Clearly, it's well documented from Europe by the middle of the, by the middle of the 18th century, and we've seen this dramatic fall as driven here. We have no idea what menarche was back here. Mark and I have posited that it probably was not too dissimilar to what it is now. And what happened was we had the development of agriculture and the associated malnutrition, the development of towns and cities, and the, and the proliferation of infection and ill health that occurred. And then with the enlightenment of the... And both of those things led to a delay of puberty because they were associated with poor childhood nutrition and poor childhood health, which delays puberty. And then what happened is that with the enlightenment, the development of public health, maternal and child health services and so forth, we've seen the accelerated fall in the age of the secular trend in Menarche in recent times. Now, the only data we have on boys, which are, is of any way credible, is looking at the age of, is the, looking at the age they throw boys out of the Vienna Boys Choir when the voices break. And that's been well recorded for at least three or four hundred years. And again, it shows the same secular trend in the last 200 years of a decrease in the age of voice breaking uh, by about a similar margin. Peter, but, yeah, sure. Well, we've done a lot of work in rats on that. It's less clear in humans, but if you think about it, you've got to have an override system. If the woman, if the female in particular is not nutritionally competent to support a pregnancy, it's better to, del to delay the onset of menarche, the onset of fertility, until she is in a condition that she can. That's a sort of a, a just-so argument for it. But the evidence would suggest that under nutrition, is a bit in childhood is a very good break and overrides the early accelerating effects. It's the other way around for good nutrition. What about adult? Uh, now forget about biological maturation and think about psychosocial maturation. Again, we don't know how to measure it except by looking at how women were treated within their popular, and men were treated within their populations at different times in history. We have no idea what happened back here, so that's pure speculation. But we do know a lot about what happened in Rome, when women were married, when men had certain responsibilities. And it looks like, at least in that society, there was a reasonable match between the age of biological maturation 
and the acceptance in that population as some form of adult. Similarly, we only have to go to Europe to look at records of when people were allowed to drive on warships, uh, be a midshipman in the Navy, would take responsibilities when women were married, etc., etc., to get a sense of when they were accepted as an adult in society. But we also now know in our Western societies that it's very different, that there's a long gap between the age of biological maturation, which is about 12 years on average for girls in New Zealand, and the age at which law will allow them to do certain things. They're not allowed to have sex until they're 16. Doesn't, they're not allowed to, to go into a bar till they're 21. Not allowed to drive a rental car till they're 25. When is it that a person's an adult? Interesting social phenomenon to reflect about. But what the point I'm trying to make is, it looks as if there has been a mismatch between two aspects of our maturation appear. A biological maturation shown by the green line and a socially determined maturation shown by the red line. And for the first time in our evolutionary history, we have this long extended adolescence, and that is something society is not prepared for. But it may be more complicated than that. Much to our surprise when we go looking at the literature of brain development, we're now finding that some aspects of brain maturation do not occur until well into the end of the third decade of life. And the parts of the brain that mature last are frontothalamic pathways, which in layman's terms are the pathways that give you emotional control, impulse control, wisdom, and judgment. They're not maturing, at least based on anatomical lines, until late in, pre late in the third decade of life. And when we do a whole lot of fancy studies of functional MRI, and so forth, we can see that compared to adults, adolescents do indeed have impaired impulse control. And when we do functional studies, and these are quite old studies, which were related to studies done in the US trying to decide when children were old enough to have the vote, you can see on a large number of measures, there's something changing about executive function much later in life than when children go through biological maturation. And so in simple terms, you can argue that we've got really early maturation of reward pathways within the striatum. I apologize to neuroscientists here and making it very simple. And delayed maturation of impulse and emotional control pathways occurring in the prefrontal cortex. Now, the issue that arises from that is, is this something new or not? Has it always been that brain maturation has taken that long? But in simpler societies, the fact that you're not treated, that you can be treated as an adult at an earlier age than we choose to treat young people as adults, may be relevant, may be a result of the fact that that society is simpler and that there's not as much requirement for those later impulse control, emotional social control mechanisms as there is in an advanced Western society. A second hypothesis might be the society's become so measurably more complex that it takes longer to get all the psychological skills one needs to, uh, uh, to and therefore it takes longer for the brain to mature. The third possibility could be is that something we're doing in Western society has slowed brain maturation. Well, let's just peel this apart a bit more. One of the most interesting things in evolutionary comparative biology is the size of our neocortex. That's the bit of the brain that we're interested in here that's going to give us these frontothalamic pathways. And Robin Dunbar, years ago, showed this relationship that if he looked at all the primate species which he could identify and adjusted their, their, their brain size on the x-axis uh, on a log-log scale against mean group size, that's the social group size 
of the, that those primates lived in, in the wild, he found a remarkably linear relationship on a log-log basis. When he put humans onto that graph, extrapolating them from their brain, neocortical brain size, he found that humans, he extrapolated that humans evolve living in group sizes of 100 to 150 people. And he came up with long lists of things to show that human social organisation over many, many hundreds of years has been built around group sizes of about 100 to 150 people. For instance, the size of a Hutterite village is about 150 people. The size of doomsday villages was that. That People did live in relatively small networks. The number of people you, you invite to your wedding is about 150 people. And interestingly enough, the, number of, the average number of Facebook friends that people now have is about 150 Facebook friends. So it does appear that there might be something in it. Could it simply be that our brain is nicely evolved to cope with 150 people, but living in the much denser social and communication networks of modern society, we're not as well equipped, and therefore the brain needs to mature further. It always took this long, 30 years, for the brain to fully mature, but the skills of the higher level of skill needed to cope with a more complex society did not matter, and therefore you could be perceived as an adult at a young age. Now we could test that, if we could get some of Peter Ellison's populations and get them into fancy MRIs, then we could resolve once and for all whether in all populations it takes so long for the brain to mature as long as this, or whether this is something new. It would be very easy to test. In theory, we'd just need a very wealthy donor to provide for the jet to move these people to places where there's MRIs. Another anthropologist argued that it just might be that the skills we need are more complex in a Western society, and it therefore takes longer to learn. Uh, we need a longer juvenile period to learn all the skills. I don't think there's any anthropologist who would accept this hypothesis any longer, but I put it up for completion. Again, we could, by doing comparative studies across populations with, with fancy tools, resolve that hypothesis. And if you think about it, there is much more to learn in a way in modern society than there used to be, but we won't go into there now because of time. The third one, and the one which intrigues me most because of my public policy role, is how our cultural policies in fact slowed brain maturation. There's been an enormous shift in child rearing practices in the West. We've gone from being very loose with young children and very regulated with our adolescents in terms of what they do and when they do it to the other way around. Every Western mum and dad now worries about what their three, four, five-year-old does. Mother's out at work, therefore what they do after school is much more regulated. The idea of the kids running down to the forest and climbing trees and doing what they used to do, which we did when we were kids, now is gone, at least in my society. And when I was adolescents, we were very tightly regulated. Homework, limited number of choices at school, five subjects, that's what you do, no choice. There was no TV, there was nothing else. Now, what parent knows what their adolescence is doing at any one time? Could that have changed things? Could it be that the nature of early childhood education has changed? Early childhood education used to be about socialisation. Early childhood education in many Western countries is now about cognitive skill development. And yet a lot of work has gone on to show that um, the earlier stages of frontothalamic development require certain forms of socialisation experiences in the first five years of life. And could it be the Western drive to see that your kid can read, write, do all sorts of things at four and five so they can pass an exam to go to primary school, has actually shifted the focus of early childhood education away from proper emotional and social development. There's actually an experiment going on in Italy at the present time in a city where they're removing all cognitive development uh, from preschool and focusing solely on social development to see what will happen over time because the evidence that this may matter is growing and growing and growing. Now, does it, so 
And the importance of that is that we're seeing in New Zealand, as a result of this discussion, a major shift of a right-wing government from focusing early childhood education on cognitive development to a far greater focus on non-cognitive development to try and prevent what's happening in Britain now happening in New Zealand in a few years' time. Now, does all this matter, this mismatch between brain development, emotional, treating them as an adult, and when they go through biological puberty? Well, yes, it does. And this is one of the most amazing studies in adolescent psychiatry they know, which is the SMASH study, 02 study from Switzerland, where every adolescent in one canton, French-speaking canton in Switzerland, was subjected to the most extensive uh, professional psychiatric evaluation between 18 and 19 years of age, 18 and 20 years of age. And all they did there was compare children in the north, boys, and in this case it's boys, but they did it also for girls, whose onset of puberty was in the middle third, was at the average for their peers, to children whose onset of puberty was early compared to their peers in tertiles. Now, it's self-reported puberty, which has got a limitation on the study, but that doesn't matter, I don't think. What you can see is boys who had greater mismatch, that is, who had earlier onset of biological puberty relative to their peers, and they're all living, it's a monocultural society, so they're all living in a <coughs> relatively standard psycho, psycho, psychosocial environment, had much higher incidence, not just of the things you would expect by having earlier puberty, namely a little bit of risk-taking activity, but when you see their psychological morbidity, and in particular the impact on the rates of suicide attempt in males, this is very dramatic indeed. There's thousands of kids in this particular study. Equally true of females as shown here, but when you go further, and there's lots of studies in the literature like this, you can see girls who are greater mismatched, that is, have the earliest age of biological maturity in their society, and these again, this is Finnish data, so another relatively monocultural society. You can see the earlier age, once their menarche got outside the normative range, uh, uh, it got particularly low, you can see the incidence of bulimia, of uh, depressive <coughs> disease, and so forth, rises dramatically. So these things really do matter. Now, in view of time, we're going to move on, because I think we're running out of time, but I want to come back to this question I left you with. Why is it that first-born children are more likely to get obese? Now, I like this study, because I didn't do the study. The study was done by somebody else, but they did it because they had read our papers in evolutionary biology and Evo Devo, and it said to them a hypothesis that they could test in proximate terms. So here's one of the good examples of why uh, of, of, of evolutionary medicine, uh, evolutionary biology being applied to address a question that nobody ever thought to ask before. Firstborn children are fat, end up as adults, irrespective of their mother's body weight, much fatter than adults. Anybody have an idea why that might be? There's possible, several possible explanations. Well, the first thing, of course, is the little emperor syndrome. Could it simply be that these children, first child, first child mother, doesn't have, mother over-invests in them? Of course, in China, most children first born and it could be argued that the parents and grandparents overinvest in them. That could be the case, but in fact, people have gone on, and I can tell you now, that when you look at these children at birth, their DNA at birth, they're epigenetically very different. Firstborn children are epigenetically very different to secondborn children, and even when they're being breastfed, they've got different weights, rates of weight gain. So there is at least a biological component, yeah. They are. They're about 80 grams smaller. And, so, uh, and a little bit earlier. Correct. So isn't the evolutionary question then 
why are firstborn children smaller? Their mothers are less mature. And what's the evolutionary factor that, 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 uh, that why is that important? Because uh, at that stage, mothers are not, are, they have not reached peak reproductive value. They're still uh, investing in themselves slightly more than they're investing in their own. Correct. But there's another fact as well. The pelvis is not fully reach its maximum dimension. It's the last bit of your skeleton to reach its maximal dimensions. And while linear growth stops soon after menarche, it takes about four years after menarche before the pelvis reaches maximal dimi dimensions. Therefore, it makes evolutionary sense to have a system that limits the growth of, of, of the baby at a time when they most likely have already have their, had their first baby. Now, why does it occur at approximate levels? Because the uterine arteries don't dilate as well at the first in the first pregnancy as they do in second pregnancy. Yeah. Are there any data from um, mothers who start reproducing there at 30 when one assumes their growth is increasing, but then they may go on to have three kids? There There's still data that their firstborn children are smaller. And, and, and so the approximate mechanism persists, namely the uterine arteries won't dilate, don't dilate as well. You've got to have one pregnancy before the elastin in the <coughs> uterine arteries breaks down and they can maximally dilate. So the approximate mechanism is the same, it's probably, but we can actually argue it probably in, in an evolutionary sense why it occurred. There may be a life history argument as well, and I'm, and I'm a bit nervous about the life history argument, but it could be, Peter, that mother doesn't want to invest as much energy in the first pregnancy as you would in subsequent pregnancies because first children are more likely to die anyhow. Now, there's just something that Pat Monaghan's raised as an alternate argument to think about. The point I want to make here about this story is simply evolutionary medicine is not just a th is theoretical in a sense, but it can lead to some interesting questions which physiologists can then go and answer. It also can have public health implica implications. Think about the fact that every child in China, more than 50 percent, well not every child, about 50 percent of children in China, 60 percent of children in China, 70 percent of children in Italy are firstborn children. What are the implications this has for, for paediatrics in the future? And there are some real world applications I'm absolutely involved in now that come because of my evolutionary biology interest in evolutionary medicine. The first is the life course approach to adolescence. I've already alluded to the fact that I have a right wing government, central right wing government, who traditionally has all been about kids must learn this at school and must do that at school, and our preschools are all about kids knowing all of this. They are very worried about adolescent morbidity. New Zealand kids have the second highest rate of adolescent morbidity in the Western world. As a result of putting this argument in evolutionary and life course terms, this government has changed its attitude and is now putting a focus in on the issue, or is in the process of doing so, about the issues of emotional development in young children, how we might address that issue. Quite a remarkable shift. September 19th and 20th, the United Nations is having a General Assembly specially devoted to non-communicable disease. The original draft manifesto for that, that United Nations, the leaders draft it all now, was all about all you have to do is stop doing anything that's nice. Stop eating, stop exercising, stop smoking, stop drinking, blah, 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 and the world will have no, no chronic disease. Well, that's manifestly not the case. Now, as a result of cogent arguments, some of which are in the handout, the paper I've put in your folder about why we're losing the war against the beastie, which is essentially a set of life course and evolutionary arguments, if, although they're not presented in that way in that paper. The draft coming forward to the United Nations General Assembly is using words like, we need to take a life course approach. If we're going to deal with, mater or if we're going to deal with the issues of non-communicable non disease, we have to focus more on maternal and child health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point being is this has come from purely an evolutionary and a life course set of arguments and being taken through 
fought through the WH and so forth. So these things, the point I'm making here is this may be theoretical stuff, this may be conceptual. Randy's giving you some examples how it might be applied in psychiatry. But understanding how we evolved and how we develop has public health and social implications, which mean that this field is going to be very important in the future. I'm very proud of the fact that using evolutionary arguments, we've been able to change the way the United Nations is going to focus on non-communicable disease. That's a fairly important argument coming out of, uh, out of evolutionary medicine. Thank you very much.